Okay, good. This is me from, can I be heard? Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Actually, I would request uh, those of you who are behind to come here. You get a much better view of all the people on the side. So yeah. rather than me having a long tunnel vision around one end of the floor, <laughs> let's make it a little more friendly. I'll collect the, so in case uh, my voice begins to crack, I may take a little break to chew uh, strep cell or something like that. Well, Governor, Dr. Subarao, Director IG, IDR, Dr. Mahendra Day, Professor Surya Naran, members of the faculty, students, researchers, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be invited to deliver the second Foundation Day lecture uh, of this institute. Actually, I have a slight, if peripheral, personal connection with the founding of the institute. As uh, the director has said, uh, this institute was conceived by the present Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, when he was governor of the RBI. And he wrote to the then Prime Minister, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, seeking his formal consent to have the institute named after the late Prime Minister, Indira Gandhi. Now, my peripheral involvement is that I processed that letter, because I was the additional secretary at the time. And you know, all of you who are government know that processing things is quite important. Many a good idea gets lost because the papers can't be traced. So I think here is one good example, I feel, that at least I'm exonerated from any such blame. I also had the pleasure uh, of being present when my boss, the then Prime Minister, uh, gave the inaugural address towards the end of December in 1987. So I remember very much, the, in fact, I dug out the lecture, uh, and they gave me a scanned copy where it has some scribbles in his own handwriting. And, and I do remember that he put the things very precisely, as uh, Mahendra Devji has already mentioned, but he did say something about the IGIDR, which I think should be quoted. And he said, you have an important role to play in shaping future policy, holding up the light to our achievements and our shortcomings, making us alive and responsive to the ever-changing environment in which development takes place. So I see that as the role of research institutions uh, holding up the light to our achievements. I can understand, by the way, that from an academic point of view, that doesn't attract too many people. So I think we have to do a little bit of shining the light on our achievements ourselves. But certainly holding up the light to our shortcomings is actually very, very important. And I think the last bit, the ever-changing environment, that is really crucial because, and I will come to that, uh, success doesn't consist of simply carrying on doing uh, what has worked in the past. But I think the then Prime Minister set a task for IGIDR, which I know from the work that I've seen since then, it really has performed. I think your first director, my good friend, Kirit Parikh, uh, did a very interesting piece at the time. The Prime Minister, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, on his rural visits had pronounced that according to him, or his perception, uh, not more than 15 paise, uh, of the money we spend on various programs actually gets to the people uh, who it's intended for. And you know, uh, I was criticized a lot by many people who uh, firmly believe in these programs under the mistaken impression that this is something I had fed to the PM. But actually, it was a completely spontaneous remark of the Prime Minister during the rural tours he undertook in 1987. And I think the first academic verification of this uh, was Kirit Parikh's paper when he looked at the PDS. And he did an analysis that if the purpose of the PDS was actually to help the poor, and he did some calculation of how much of the money that we spent on the PDS then uh, actually got to the poor. And his conclusion was 16 paise out of one rupee. This has to be the smallest conceivable error in a high level statement on policy that I can think of. Uh, and I think it was a very important point because it then led to a change in policy. Because I think in about 10 years later, uh, in 1997, we moved to what is called the targeted PDS. And the idea was to specifically target uh, the poorer groups. Uh, and of course, uh, that did improve the situation. Uh, but when the Planning Commission analyzed it a few years ago, uh, the conclusion was that only 50% of what is actually spent gets to the poor. So huge improvement from Kirit Parikh's estimate of 16%, but still uh, quite a substantial amount of leakage. And I think this is relevant as we formulate policy in future. You know, uh, Mr. Gandhi at that time, uh, as uh, Mahendra Dev has said, it did say that, yes, we've achieved 5%, but is it enough? Is 5% going to raise our people out of poverty? Is it going to provide enough jobs, etc.? And then uh, he went on to lay out what he thought was the goal we should aim at. He said, we must set our goals to lift us to the forefront of the economically powerful nations of the world in the space of no more than one generation. Now, as far as growth is concerned, I think he would be happy to know that we've left 5% pretty far behind. And if you look at the 11th plan on, as an average, we will probably achieve around 8.2% or so, depending on what happens in the current year. If you take a longer view of the whole decade, we're probably somewhere just below 8%. So the limited objective of getting away from 5% has been achieved. 
quite a long while after that objective was set. But what about the objective of making India one of the powerful economically, one of the nations at the forefront amongst the economically powerful? Now, this is an issue that is attracting a lot of attention. Because I think people have seen the growth that has taken place in India. And while domestically we are concerned, and I think rightly, that the issue of whether the growth is inclusive is still constantly uh, under questioning, and I will touch on that later, there doesn't seem to be any doubt that the potential of the country to grow rapidly appears now to be well established. Uh, and, and this is a big change, because when, when these issues were discussed, I remember in early in 1991, in the IGIDR in a conference, there was a lot of skepticism about whether economic liberalization would actually achieve on the growth front, uh, the results that were being expected of it. So I think there is change, but what about, what about being at the forefront? But the present assessment is that you know, if India were to grow at an average rate of 7 to 8% average rate over the next 25 years, uh, then somewhere around 2035, uh, India would be the third largest GDP in the world. China would be number one. I think everybody expects that. Uh, the United States would be number two. And that India would actually overtake Japan and we would come somewhere uh, third in this list. Uh, you know, the Prime Minister was very clear at the time, he didn't say the third, the richest, he's the most powerful. And powerful means really size of GDP. In that sense, it's very clear that the economy is on an upward path. And therefore, the, the task we have to set ourselves is, can this be sustained? Now, you know, an average of 7 to 8% over 25 years has to be an average based on higher rates earlier with a gradual deceleration. I mean, if we get to what is well above a middle-income country level by the year 2035, you don't expect it to grow at 9%. Even China in its 12th plan, which was just unveiled about a month ago, is talking of a lower growth rate for China at about 7.5%. So in my view, the 